Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Ukraine has just suffered its biggest Russian bombardment in weeks. It was really massive. There were lots of missiles and drones over the night. And we do know of at least three people killed. Professor of Defence Studies Michael Clark will explain the latest military developments and we'll hear how marshy islands in the middle of a river have become a key battleground. The UK has announced a new operations centre for Royal Marines inside the Arctic Circle as hundreds of them practice to defend Norway's frozen border with Russia. And Joint Viking is our opportunity to showcase how we prepare to fight in this type of uh, environment. We're trying to be mountain ghosts. We're trying to disappear in this terrain. And the story of the women who overcame huge resistance to play a vital part in Britain's military intelligence effort in World War II. These women are parachute dropped in the dead of night into German-occupied France to send intelligence back to Britain. You know, some of them are explosive experts and are blowing up sections of railways. We'll get to all of that in a minute or two. But Mike, uh, we've got several big announcements coming up for defence in the next few days. Talk us through them. Yes, uh, most of it will happen on Monday. The Prime Minister is going to San Diego for this big meeting with the Australian Prime Minister, Albanese, and President Biden. And they'll be talking through the AUKUS deal. This is the Australia British American deal on submarines, and that's going to be a pretty big announcement. On the back of that, I think they'll be talking about the financial settlement for the Ministry of Defence, which won't be as good, but they'll be burying it in some good AUKUS news, I think. And also, we now know, as of yesterday, that the integrated review refresh will also be released on Monday. We won't know quite when the defence version of that, the defence white paper that will follow that, or the defence command paper, we're not quite sure when that will come out, but the refresh looks as if it'll come out on Monday. So three big things, the AUKUS deal, the financial statement of what the MOD is going to get, um, and the I inter- integrated review refresh. Be a big day on Monday, I think. And Mike, once we've got all these announcements, what will they tell us about the future of the forces and what won't we yet know? Well, we'll know probably that the amount of extra money being given to MOD is probably not going to be enough and is not what Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, is asking for. I think we'll probably know that. And what we won't know is what the specific um, implications of that are for defence. That will come a bit later, but maybe quite soon, maybe in a week or two. That's what we really want to see, the Defence Command paper that will follow on from all of this. So no prizes for guessing what we'll be talking about this time next week, but we've still got plenty of work to do before then, Mike. Let's update ourselves on what's happening in Ukraine, not least because that's a significant driver of the refresh to the integrated review. The country has just suffered its biggest wave of air attacks in weeks. Russia fired at least 80 missiles and also attacked with drones. It left parts of the country without electricity as people took shelter. It all began in the beginning of the night. So in total, the air raid serene was on for seven hours. So we've heard uh, a number of explosions. We don't know if that was like air defense systems or the missiles hitting the infrastructure, but it was pretty loud. Mike, is this the start of the expected fresh offensive from Russia, do you think? It might be, but I suspect it may not be. I mean, we've been waiting for another nationwide air attack for a while because they've been doing it about every two weeks or so. And we thought there would be one maybe last week. It didn't happen. Interestingly, the Ukrainians weren't as effective this time in terms of the air defence. Ukraine is is saying they they shot down 34 of them. They'd normally shoot down a, a much higher proportion than 34 out of 81. There's no other indication that Russian heavy armour in great numbers or the the Russian Air Force is really ready to deploy it in quite a big way. So we're still waiting to see a, a bigger push from Russia. There's concentration of men and they're throwing those into the attacks in the Donbass, but not really of the, the heavy metal and the air forces that we would expect to see. Well, on the ground, the biggest battle is still for Bakhmut. The Wagner Group say they've taken the east of the city. The deputy mayor has talked of fighting in the streets but rejected claims of Russian control. And Ukrainian generals have asked for and have been given permission to keep fighting. Mike, what is the thinking there and how is it going to play out? 
It's certainly true that the Wagner Group seem to have got up to the Bakhmutka River, which runs right through the uh, centre of the city. But if they want to cross the river and the Ukrainians try to defend that crossing, then the Russians will have a hard time. It's more uh, irrelevant that the uh, Wagner Group have, have almost surrounded the city now with some airborne Russian forces. And that there's only one road out now, one reliable road, and I can, I can absolutely confirm this from other conversations. And if that really gets cut, it's already under artillery fire. But if it really gets cut, then the Ukrainians will be surrounded. And so I suspect that if the 504 gets cut, or looks as if it's about to be cut, they really will withdraw. But undoubtedly, the defence of Bakhmut has now become a sort of political symbol for both sides. Well, the big battle before Bakhmut was for Kherson in the south, which Ukraine freed from Russian occupation four months ago. The fighting there has not moved far. Ukrainian troops are now having to make perilous journeys across icy waters to defend marshy islands in the Dnipro estuary. Daily Telegraph correspondent Colin Freeman has just returned from Kherson and has been telling me about the seemingly insignificant patches of land that are now at the centre of the riverine battles. Most of them are low-lying spits of land. A lot of them are used actually um, as, as holiday homes uh, during the summer by um, retired pensioners, so on and so forth. So it's an, an unusual sort of place to be battling. But uh, I spoke to some Ukrainian forces who had been um, basically spending their days. They, they, they get dropped off by boat and then their job is to try and hold the islands and stop them coming under Russian control. They spend several days holed up on a front line, basically just trying to guard against any Russian incursions, of which there seem to be quite a lot, not always by infantry, but uh, by mortar fire. So how difficult is it for those who are defending those islands? I don't think it's easy. First of all, they have to get taken there by boat. You've got a limited option in terms of escape routes. You, the only route in, is, is by, in or out is by boat. The boat journeys themselves can be quite perilous through a river that has got a lot of ice in it. It's very cold. These are small um, ribbed motorboats. If you fall off one, if, for example, your boat hits an ice flow or something like that, and you're wearing full body armour, then there is a chance you may drown. Then once they're on the islands, the ground is very marshy, so it's difficult to dig trenches. So really you're reliant on buildings for cover. The Russians know that, so when the Russians pinpoint where the Ukrainian forces are, they shell them as much as they can, trying to blow away all their cover, basically leave them stuck in the open. So it's a, it's a fairly challenging soldiering experience, but it, it's apparently mentally exhausting. You've got shelling coming in a lot Occasionally you have an engagement with a Russian unit. Often the Russian units are apparently just trying to probe the area to tell where the Ukrainian forces are. Uh, and then, of course, the moment the Ukrainian forces open fire, they then give their position away, which the Russian infantry will then pass on to their artillery crews, who will then respond with artillery, which apparently is often pretty accurate. So, Colin, how are these Ukrainian forces armed? Is it just men with their own guns or do they have more heavy weaponry? I think it's fairly standard infantry stuff. Obviously, they have artillery backup as well, and that they also perform a kind of recon role in trying to identify where the Russian forces are. Certainly, some of the guys I spoke to said that um, when Russians had attacked, on one occasion they, they'd been repelled, and then that the uh, Ukrainian artillery had opened up as the Russians retreated to the far side, five or six or possibly more were killed. And just how important are these islands? Say the Russians were to capture them, what would it mean? Whoever controls those islands uh, can effectively, to some extent, control the traffic up and down the river Dnipro, which is the main river that feeds Kiev and effectively splits Ukraine into east and west. Um, in terms of its importance, it's, I suppose it's probably not unlike being able to control the Thames. And also it would mean that the Ukrainians on the far side of the river Dnipro, the, the Kherson side, would be probably thinking, uh, well, at what point might the Russians make a renewed assault on the Kherson itself using these islands as a, a possible staging point? And Colin, the city of Kherson itself liberated four months ago. What's it like now? Uh, it's not great. Um, the city used to have 300,000 people. That dropped to about 100,000 um, during the occupation. Now the population is down to about 50,000. 
There was great jubilation when the Russians pulled out, but having pulled out to the far side of the River Dnipro, the Russians now just simply shell the city from afar. When I was there, it was barely any time of day when you didn't hear um, exchanges of mortar fire, uh, so art artillery fire. You can drive through large parts of the city and barely see a soul. There are still some shops open. There's a cafe near me, near my hotel that was open, which felt like business as usual, but most places shut at about six or seven in the evening. There's an alcohol ban. It reminds me a bit of Kiev during the Russian siege last year. It, it does still feel like a, a city at war, yeah, even though it's now, I think, more harassing fire than fire from an, an army that is, is planning to take the city, if you see what I mean. And you wrote a, a really interesting article last week <clears throat> about uh, the work of some of the women in Kherson, notably um, Anastasia, who runs a cafe. Tell me, tell me what she was doing. She was spying, wasn't she, for, on the Russians? Yes. So Kherson had a, a large partisan network spring up during the Russian occupation. Some of those people were, you know, doing your classic train partisan activity, going around sabotaging um, Russian positions, trying to assassinate officials in the pro-Russian uh, occupation administration. But a lot of people were just acting as the eyes and ears. They were often people like Anastasia, who was a bartender. We also spoke to somebody who was a, described herself as a housewife. Just ordinary people who, who didn't have any special training, but who, as a result, were the last people that the Russians would suspect of spying. And um, Anastasia would watch any Russian soldiers who came into her bar. They didn't make herself very popular with her. They would get drunk a lot and they would sometimes threaten her waitresses. But I think it was just identifying any Russian officer who looked like he was um, a high commander and passing on information about those sorts of people, which all then fed into a wider intelligence picture, I think. Um, she didn't really know what the information was used for. She, she wouldn't have particularly want to know that some Russian soldier that she had uh, passed on information about was then killed very shortly afterwards. That did apparently happen one time. Her actual handler did apparently linger outside of another bar and follow the Russian soldier as he left the bar and stabbed him to death on the street corner. The guy was drunk, apparently, so it wasn't too difficult. And then the, the mother that we spoke to, the housewife, she said she would just wander around the town with her 10-year-old son, going out on walks, looking at like the picture of innocence. Meanwhile, keeping an eye on any hotels in the city, industrial sites or other places that would be used either as barracks for troops or as places where they would um, park up tanks. And the Ukrainian artillery would then um, try and target those, th those buildings and those hotels. Colin Freeman, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Now, even if you've been struggling with snow in the UK this week, you probably still want to spare a thought for the 1,000 Royal Marines in the far north of Norway. They're on winter training and exercise. It's a long-standing part of life for many Marines, but it has a new significance after the war in Ukraine because this could be about defending Norway's border with Russia. And so the government has announced it will use the relatively new Camp Viking as an Arctic operations base for at least least the next 10 years. Bryony Williams has just returned from there. Bryony, hello. Um, tell us about the area. I looked at the weather yesterday. The high was minus 13. It sounds pretty harsh. Yes. Um, so obviously it is in the Arctic Circle. So temperatures regularly hit kind of minus 15, minus 20. I think when I was there, um, it literally was that minus 15 on the mountains and then um, minus 20 for a few days. And as you mentioned, I actually stayed on Camp Viking and this was set up in December 2021. So it's been in use for, for a little bit of time now. It's about 40 miles south of Tromso and not far from a place called Bardafoss, which is where the the commandos were originally based and that's still home to the air base where commando helicopter force work out of and they moved to Camp Viking so they could accommodate the higher numbers coming to the high north each year and so Camp Viking is it, fairly secluded there's a, a petrol station a small supermarket and that's about it and and, mm. and I think the significance with with this kind of relatively new base is that because it's it's theirs essentially they 
they can kind of add to it what they want. And so when they're working there, if they feel there's a need for perhaps an extra heated hangar to have equipment and vehicles in, they can kind of do that relatively quickly. And, and, and you know, it's kind of it, little things like because it's only been used for the past couple of years, you know, the beds are extremely comfy. <laughs> the facilities, mm. uh, you know, the facilities are really good. So I think when I stayed there, you know, the, the hot water for the shower came on instantly at the hotel that I stayed in down the road for a couple of days you know the hot water took took a while to to get there so actually you know small they may seem like relatively small things but if you're if you're troops in the field for long periods of time and and you come back to camp you know that those small things can can really make a huge difference when you're out in those like you said really really kind of treacherous and harsh conditions Not quite five star, but working on it, eh? Some of the winter training, though, does sound like it's been lifted from a James Bond film. Skiing, learning to drive skidoos, but this is not some big jolly, is it? No, and, and, you know, this is one of the harshest environments in the world where just surviving takes planning and headspace. And then you've got to fit in, um, you know, actually working in it and fighting in it. So they get trained up on things like skidoos and skiings because at the end of the day, you know, that's what locals use to get around. And it's the same for the troops on, on the ground. There are some specialist vehicles like you've got the Vikings and BVs that can move across kind of big areas um, of ice and snow. But for raw Marines who are moving kind of deeper into the battle space, they could be traveling miles over the mountains in small groups, pretty much being self-sufficient. So they have to be proficient in all those kind of skills like skiing and on the skidoos. I spoke to one Royal Marine who from 4-5 Commando, he's been telling me about his experience on well, the skidoo or what they call over snow reconnaissance vehicle. So you've got to select your route, you've got to plan it well ahead, right? What sort of kit am I taking? How skilled are the drivers? Are we going to be able to get through and move through this environment safely, mainly, but also tactically? So we've got to put in deception as well, because obviously in this environment, your tracks aren't covered unless you get some big heavy snowfall and you can't always rely on that. You've got to put in deception tracks that will make it look like you're going off another way. So if that means you're going to have to go off a couple of kilometres a certain direction, go back on yourself. But once you start getting towards our objective, you won't just take the skidoo straight to your objective, because obviously the, the noise of them gives you away as well so that's when we'll go move on to skis and then we'll ski into our position but then deception will come into that as well creating different tracks different routes a lot to plan out mike uh, this new arctic operations base a more permanent site for royal marines in norway is this the foothold in the high north that we've been hearing about Yes, it's certainly part of it. As Bryony's report shows, operating in the snow, operating in the in the high north is really very, very specialist. And you can't mm. just you can't just say to the troops, well, it's a bit more uncomfortable. Get on with it. You'd need you need the skill. You need to have done it. And you need a lot of a, a lot of exercises to be able to do it effectively. So it's quite a big ask to get more than a, a small force ready to operate in this sort of area, in this sort of environment. And Mike, the Defence Committee this week called for the government to ensure we can play a leading role in the High North. Why is it so important to the UK? Because the High North also involves Russia. It involves the the routes that are opening up across the top of the world through the Arctic as global warming creates the the, the famous Northwest Passage that the you know the governments have been looking for for the last three hundred years. Well, it is opening up, and so the north, the high north, and north, the North Atlantic will be a major trade route in the years to come. And not least with Finland and Sweden joining NATO, um, then Norway's role you know and the British Norway connection is even more important because Britain can have a very important role to play in uh, collaborating with these Scandinavian countries who all are are very concerned about you know the security of of the high north it used to be just an area of 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 interest now it's an area of national security importance and Brian that the marines right now are on a multinational exercise joint viking just explain what that is Well, yeah, so Joint Viking takes place every two years and it involves thousands of personnel from kind of NATO allies and partner nations. And really the the aim, just to kind of pick up on what Mike was saying, is basically to make sure way Norway can be defended and troops can operate in this this kind of Arctic environment. It is that kind of repetition needed to keep this skill set up and running. It's not something that you can just get 
overnight. There's real kind of um, danger at, at, at play where if you make a wrong decision, you, you literally could die because of the type of environment that you're working in. Here's Major Matt Snook. He's OC Yankee Company from 4-5 Commando Royal Marines who are out there now. And Joint Viking is our opportunity to showcase what we can do uh, in the advanced space uh, forward of the main body of forces and how we prepare to fight in this type of uh, environment. We're trying to be mountain ghosts, we're trying to disappear in this terrain and that means that we've got to be good at operating in the environment, uh, we've got to be good at uh, blending into the environment, we've got to be good at uh, maximising the terrain, using the terrain and the weather conditions to our own advantage. When you're in the field you go through around about 5,000 calories a day just from from wow. yeah, just from surviving <laughs> and being out there. And so and so that does take a real kind of high skill set. So it is just that getting those kind of skills and drills um, down to make sure that you can survive and operate and and then yes, keeping up that specialism. Really interesting stuff, Bryony. Thank you so much for your time. Now, historically, military operations have been an almost entirely male domain. It was only out of necessity in the First World War that British women were brought in for administrative and practical support. Those women's auxiliaries were reluctantly recreated in the lead up to the Second World War. Initially, they were confined to seemingly minor roles like cooks, clerks and fabric workers. But as the war drew on, they became ever more essential, not just to administration, but operations too. Behind the pilots who fought the Battle of Britain and took the fight to Germany, a team of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force providing battle-winning and life-saving intelligence. But to make that contribution to the Allied victory, they first had to overcome strong resistance. Their story is told in a new book, The Women Behind the Few, written by military historian Sarah Louise Miller. The British authorities and the military were fairly convinced that women should not be involved in intelligence work because they couldn't possibly be useful in that sense. They, they wouldn't be able to keep secrets. They couldn't be trusted based on examples like Marta Hari. She was an exotic dancer who sort of slept her way through the, the German high command to, to get information. If they did give information away, it might not even be on purpose. They might just be a bit gossipy. And then there was the fear that they might sort of emotionally buckle under the pressure, being kind of face to face with the effects of warfare, which in intelligence work you often are. And what changed on a practical level? How did women move into these intelligence roles? How did the attitudes change? It kind of had to. As war goes on, you need more and more men at the fighting front. The military has no choice but to call on women, and it does so begrudgingly. But really, these women prove themselves utterly invaluable to the military, and it's by their success that their options continue to open up. And they worked on the Dowding system and the Wine Network. Can you explain what they were exactly? The Dowding system is the world's first fully integrated air defence system. So we have this brand new technology, radar. So the information on the incoming raids is fantastic, but you have to be able to get it to the fighter pilots who can be scrambled to intercept those raids. And, and the Dowding system is that system. So they intercept the information physically on a radar site on the coast. They send it to the filter room at the headquarters of Fighter Command. It's filtered. It's then sent on to be plotted. So WAF are marking on a map of the country. Where is the Luftwaffe right now? What is it doing? How strong is it? That information then goes to the fighter squadrons who meet the Luftwaffe raids as they're coming in. And you have reports from German pilots appearing over the British coast with a welcoming party in the form of Spitfires and Hurricanes, and they have no idea how that's happened, and it's because of the Dowding system. And the Y network? So this is a network of listening posts to intercept enemy radio transmissions. So they might be air-to-ground, air-to-air, where the Luftwaffe is concerned, ship communications, even panzer divisions. Incredibly useful information. And there's a quarter of a million women served in the, in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force during the course of the war. And of that, tens of thousands of women are involved in the intelligence effort. That's incredible numbers. What was life like for these women? It was, I mean, if you read their diaries, some of them, it's the time of their lives, but it's also wrought with danger and sorrow and difficulty and pressure. 
if you're working on or near an RAF facility, you are a sitting duck, a target. The Luftwaffe are targeting your place of work. And WAF did die in the line of duty. They are suffering loss and, and the pain of um, the effects of war. But they've got this camaraderie that they speak of that pretty much lasted a lifetime. And they, they do speak of their kind of newfound independence away from... Some of them are away from home for the first time. Some of them are 19 years old. Some of them are 17 years old. It's, it's really a, a kind of mixed bag of emotions. And you, you write about their dedication in the book as well and about how some of them went to incredible lengths to ensure they didn't even accidentally betray the secrets they held. What did they do? Yeah, some of them uh, were so afraid... I mean, I spoke to a 98-year-old veteran recently and she said she remembered signing the Official Secrets Act and there was a gun on the table next to it. They were told they'd be shot if they, if they revealed anything. But it wasn't just that. It was, it was strong belief in the necessary secrecy. Some of them went to the lengths of not accepting anesthesia during dental procedures because they were afraid that they would accidentally give something away under anesthesia. And I, I'm pretty sure I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> Almost all of these women were working in relative safety of the UK, but there were some who did go behind enemy lines as part of the Special Operations Executive. That's quite a starting turnaround from the beginning of the war when women weren't trusted to be able to keep secrets. Yes, it's only a very small number. It's a sabotage unit. So these women are parachute dropped in the dead of night into German-occupied France um, and their jobs are to send intelligence back to Britain to assist resistance movements. You know, some of them are explosive experts and are blowing up sections of railway, especially before D-Day, to prevent German reinforcements from getting to the front. And that is quite a startling departure from what they were able to do at the beginning of the war. And was this essentially the first time women had worked on British military operations rather than just admin and housekeeping? Uh, you see in the in the First World War and in the second, you see nurses are sent to the front lines. So you do see them on the front lines, but it's the first time they're kind of sent as a subversive presence where they're, they're agents and they're trained to kill and to blow things up. So, yeah, it's quite a, an enigmatic um, thing in that way. How many of these women did you get to meet? Not many, unfortunately. There, there aren't that many left, um, just a handful, but they are absolutely wonderful. They have such personality. And they really, I think something that really struck me was the fact that they just don't think what they did was that impressive or that important. And that's because at the time, everybody had to do something. It was our war. It was everybody's war. But it's a struggle to get them to see that what they did actually was incredibly important and very admirable. And what is the legacy today of the women behind the few? I think they really paved the way for women in our in our present day military services. I've been lucky enough to talk to some currently serving women in the RAF and in the US Air Force, and they all say that we, we point to what they call the greatest generation. They did pave the way for the way that things are today. They have a, a very important legacy, and I've been extremely privileged to be able to tell their story. Sarah Louise Muller, great to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. And you can hear more, not only from Sarah Louise, but some of the women who did that vital intelligence work, who tell their personal stories in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast, which is online now. Mike, really fascinating to hear those stories, particularly in the light of what Colin was telling us earlier about the ordinary women spying on Russians in occupied Kherson. Yes. I mean, it's what happens in total war. You know, when a whole society needs to gear up for warfare, then individuals, people, come forward with commitment and courage. And, of course, you know, women have got a, a, a different skill set sometimes, certainly a different profile when it comes to operating in an occupied territory. And, you know, if you go to the Special Forces Club, I'm not a member of it, but I've been there as a guest a few times. The Special Forces Club is a funny little club just behind Harrods. Mm. And as you walk up the stairs, there are photographs all the way up the stairs to the bar on the first floor. And there are all these young women. And they're young women that most of us have never heard of. And they're the young women of the Special Operations Executive who were dropped into France. Yeah. Not many of them survived. A lot of them were betrayed. Most of them didn't survive more than a year. And there are these photographs. You know, walking up the stairs is like walking through a, a sort of a silent memorial to these brave young women. 
Professor Michael Clark, thank you. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. We'll be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash sit rep or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chippo, thank you for listening. Bye bye. (laughs) 